Rowing Series Podcast, powered by Cargill. You have all your soil information. You know what crop you're going to seed or plant. It's time to develop the fertilizing plan to put all that information you've gathered to work. You'll see the benefits of starting out with a good fertilizer plan when the combines start to roll in the fall. You're listening to the Growing Series Podcast, powered by Cargill and presented by Sean Haney and RealAgriculture.com, bringing you timely advice to help you achieve your goals. Back for another episode of the Cargill Growing Series Podcast, where today we're talking about what makes a good fertilizer plan, and right now we are joined by Jeremy Boychin. He is an agronomist with Cargill out of Red Deer. How are you doing today, Jeremy? Not too bad. How are you doing today, John? I'm doing very well. Okay, so making that fertilizer plan. You can't you can't make any money on your farm if you don't have a good plan, and hope's not a plan, so we got to do some work beforehand here. So I put 10 pounds of P and K down with my corn every year. I'm, I'm do, that's, that's okay, right? Like I'm fine to just go ahead and do that, like kind of the way I've been doing it for the last 15, 20 years? Well, Sean, I'd say you're lucky I'm not there to give your head a shake. Uh, but my first response will be most certainly not. Uh, that is unless you're growing somewhere between five to ten bushels of whatever you're growing. Um, so there's two ways of looking at this. Um, when you put a crop in the ground and you're expecting a certain amount of yield, um, let's talk about corn, for example. Uh, if you are expecting, let's make it easy and say a hundred bushel crop of, of corn. Um, if you look at what that hundred bushel corn takes to grow, uh, and for removal of phosphorus for that crop, you're looking at about 50 pounds of phosphorus. Uh, so for one bushel, uh, is 0.5 pounds of phosphorus that's being uptaken. So <clears throat> when you're putting down 10 pounds of phosphorus and you grow a hundred bushel crop of, of corn, you're essentially shorting your field and your crops 40 pounds of phosphorus. Uh, and this is the same story with potassium. Um, with a hundred bushel crop of corn, you're looking at something like 35 and the same thing with canola. Um, if you're looking for a 50 bushel crop of canola, you're looking at somewhere between 45 and 50 pounds of phosphorus that's being pulled up with that. So if you're only putting down 10 pounds, um, you're shorting your fields and you're mining your fields, which can turn to be quite a significant issue. Um, and this kind of comes back to something that I hear quite often, which is I grow a 50 canola or I grow a 150 bushel crop of corn and I only have to put down 25 pounds of phosphorus. The, the numbers must be wrong. There's no way I need that much. Look what I'm getting. Um, and, and I mean, it's a misinterpretation of what the information is. Um, this is why soil sampling is so important because you can put down 10 pounds of phosphorus and 10 pounds of potassium and get yourself a 150 bushel crop of corn, but you're mining your soil. And this really comes down to how much phosphorus and how much potassium and other nutrients are in that soil already. Um, so if you have high amounts of that, of those nutrients in your soil already, um, you're not going to need a put to put a ton of fertilizer down to get to those yields. But that's only going to last a certain amount of time before you pull that phosphorus level and that potassium level down to a point where it's actually impacting your yield potential. So you could put it down, but you're essentially, it'd be the same as having a bank account where you're only putting $5 in every week, but you're spending $150 every week you will last depending on how much is in there, but eventually you're going to hit a point where it's going to significantly impact how many beers you'll be able to buy. Yeah. I, I only put five bucks in, but I, I'm able to take out as much as I want. I can buy that TV and that car and everything's great. So, and we, and we, we we're farming, we're not mining. Do, do you find that enough farmers understand those replenish rates and they are doing those calculations? Like I, I hear guys talking about it, but is there people that aren't? Um, absolutely. There's there's uh, enough 
um, farmers and producers and, and even some people who work in the industry that don't have a strong understanding of, of what uptake and what removal is. And this is the basis for what fertility is. Um, and I'll go back to the bank example. You know, if, if you, if you have $10,000 sitting there in your bank account, um, and, and you keep taking out and keep taking out and only put in, you know, a minimum what you think you want. Yeah, you, you feel like you're doing a great job because your return on investment is huge, but it will impact you in the future and it will continue to degrade your soil. And I, I see this as an agronomist. When I go out and take a look at people's soil samples and their results, I see it all the time. And it's guys saying that uh, this field used to produce and now it's only doing, you know, three quarters of what it's done before. And I pick up a soil sample and I can almost immediately point out where the issue is. So uh, this is why I'm so enthusiastic about this. And I'm so eager to talk about it because I feel as though um, because we talk so much about fungicides and seed selection and all the other stuff that um, the chemical companies and seed companies are, are, are talking about, there seems to be a lack of enthusiasm around the fertility aspect. And I'm going to be honest, Sean, 60% of our yield comes from soil fertility in our fertility program. And that is certainly not the weight of discussion that's going on in the agricultural industry. Well, and, you know, and we're, we're living in a time where we talk a lot about precision agriculture, and you can't have precision unless you have all the proper information, right? So uh, some of our listeners may be listening to this and saying, okay, that's fine. I get it. I understand. But so what... How, what do I actually need to get that high yielding corn and soybean crop? Um, that's a good question. Um, and I mean, again, and this is why I love agronomy, it really depends. Um, I mean, I, I can sit here where I am right now and know that in this area, a, a 40 bushel crop of canola isn't unreasonable. Um, but if I drove two hours to the east, that might be stretching it. Um, so it really depends on what your definition of high yielding is. And that's going to really be determined by where you are, uh, where you're growing your crop. Um, so the first thing you want to do is make sure you understand what a reasonable yield goal or high yielding crop is in the area that you're in. Um, because if you're in an area that's normally doing 150 bushels of corn, but you want to aim for 250, you might have to give your head a shake um, and, and figure out what's going on in the area. Um, and and the next thing you want to do on that is, uh, again, take a look at soil samples. You want to make sure that you understand where your soil restrictions are going to be. If you want to head for that 250 bushel crop of corn, you're going to need to know how much phosphorus is in your field, how much potassium is, your, is in your field, if boron is a limiting nutrient. So getting out there and finding out um, where your base level in your soil is and then a aligning that with your appropriate yield goals would be the first step. Um, and maybe I, I'll, I'll be a broken record, but I think this keeps coming back to the the, uh, the bank metaphor. Um, but if you're looking to save $10,000, let's say that's the 250 bushel average goal, if you're looking to save $10,000, if you don't know whether you have $5 in there or $9,500 in there, your approach to getting to $10,000 is going to be different. So knowing where you start is the most essential part to knowing how to get where you want to be. So if we want to, if we figure out where we want to get, where we want to get to, how do I actually create that fertilizer plan that's going to get me to that target? What, what, do I, what are the steps? What do I need to do? So well, the first thing I usually ask is, is, what are your long-term goals and what are your short-term goals? Um, so you're typically going to have short-term goals, which is what, what do I want to do with my crop next year? What kind of goals am I looking for? Um, and then Typically, where that's going to fall into is your nitrogen. Um, how much nitrogen do I need to get this crop where I want to go this year? Because phosphorus and potassium, although you're putting them down that year, only a small percentage of what you're actually putting down that year plays a role in that year's yield. Um, so knowing what your long-term versus your short-term goals are, and your long-term goals would probably play more into that phosphorus or potassium level where you're saying, okay, I am at 15 ppm in my field right now for phosphorus, um, and 
I'm pulling off 50 bushel crops all the time, but I'm not putting on enough phosphorus to sustain that. Um, where do I want my PPM to be, my phosphorus PPM to be, and what am I going to take over the next four, five, sometimes up to 10 years to get to that spot. Um, so the first thing is to align your short-term and your long-term goals. Once you have that, again, I would say go and talk to an agronomist. Um, they're going to have an idea of what's going on in your area um, and what kind of needs your crop needs based on your area and also looking at your soil samples. Um, so once you kind of align your goals with your soil samples and you're able to sit with a trusted agronomist, you'll, able, you'll be able to put together uh, a good fertility plan where you're comfortable with, okay, I'm heading for a long-term goal of increasing my phosphorus across all of my fields and I'm heading for a short-term goal of this year I only want to put down a certain amount of nitrogen because maybe it's a little more expensive this year or maybe I want to put down more nitrogen because it's a little less expensive this year um, and then working towards that short-term goal while aligning that in with your long-term goal. So once I have that plan though I've got, I've got some fertilizer to buy so is there any thought to when the best time is actually to do that and is, is there any standard rules that should be followed? Uh, again, Sean, I'd say this definitely has to do with you know how you manage your fertilizer. Um, some guys don't have the capacity to take their fertilizer in the fall, and some of them have to take it from the fertilizer plant in the spring. Um, so logistically, that's going to be your first restriction. Um, but if you're looking at purely economical, um, the best time to typically buy your fertilizer, at least in Western Canada right now, would be um, in the late summer and early fall. Uh, and if you actually look at the long-term numbers of, let's say, the price of nitrogen over the past five years, if you were to buy only in late summer and early fall, you would get about an average of $200 per metric ton cheaper if you averaged it across those five or even 10 years. Um, so there's a lot of, of guys pushing to be able to pull in fertilizer in the fall because they know if they put up a fertilizer bin, yeah, it's a bit expensive, but if you're saving yourself 200 bucks a ton on average over those five years, it'll pay for itself pretty quickly. Um, the one thing I would make sure and to caution guys on is to make sure that you're educated on how to properly store your fertilizer. Um, Cause if you're taking it in the fall, you're going to have to maintain the integrity of that fertilizer through the entire winter season so being knowledgeable on how to do that will definitely be important but i'd say for sure if you're looking to buy fertilizer and save money on it you want to manage your fertilizer to be able to get it in the fall from an application standpoint i think a lot of us have our own methods and thing you know tactics that we follow you know i have a i have a good buddy where he uses the he puts as minimal down as he can in the spring. He wants to see if he gets any rain, and then he top dresses later. Some people put it all down in the spring. We now have issues or products like slow release. When, from your standpoint, when should I be applying my fertilizer? So for in, in Ontario, um, and a great question, I love this. Uh, if for in Ontario, I mean, we, we they have a little bit more flexibility with when the application of, let's say, nitrogen can go on. Um, some guys are applying nitrogen at three different times for their corn, one at seeding, one at five to six leaf, and then one getting close to tasseling. So having that capability, def that's definitely a beneficial move to see if you can, you know, section that across the different parts of the season. Um, but if you transfer that over to Western Canada, um, there's a little less fixed flexibility in being able to apply that nitrogen later on in the season. If you have irrigation, it's a little bit easier, but the majority of guys don't have irrigation. Um, so typically the best time for them to apply, apply their nitrogen would be just before soil frees up um, or just prior to seeding. And the reasons for that is you want to mitigate any kind of nitrate loss that'll happen. So if you apply your nitrogen too early, it'll start to break down. Um, and typical nitrogen breakdown will happen anytime the soil temperature is above 10 degrees Celsius. That's that's really where that breakdown starts to happen quite significantly. Um, so if you do it before that happens, your potential for losing the nitrogen that you're applying is, is going up. If you do it closer to soil freeze up, you're going to have less loss all the way up to soil or to seeding where that's going to be your best timing uh, to make sure that that 
there's the least amount of nitrogen loss before that crop gets a hold of it. Um, with phosphorus, uh, it's a little bit of a similar story between Ontario and Western Canada. Um, phosphorus, we see a huge um, yield bump and benefit to having phosphorus go down with the seed. And this typically has to do with how much phosphorus is actually in the soil. If you have a ton of soft phosphorus in the soil, this doesn't really play as strong of a role. But if you're sitting somewhere in that 15 to 16 ppm range um, or lower, you'll see a benefit in putting that phosphorus down with your seed. Um, so a lot of guys tend to lean towards that direction of making sure it's going down with the seed. If you do have a ton of phosphorus and you want to manage how you're applying it across the field, how many passes you're doing, um, how, how long it takes, um, you can actually do some broadcasting and working in. Um, and I know there's some of that that happens in Ontario. Um, but again, what I would caution with something like that is phosphorus can be pretty detrimental to the environment. Um, we see enough algae blooms going on in some of the Great Lakes. And it's something that we need to be conscious of and making sure that, you know, when we're asking ourselves, is this the best time to apply? We're, we're, we're talking to someone, we're looking into it, and we're seeing whether this is going to happen have an environmental impact. Again, it comes back to the stewardship thing. Um, we're making sure we're making the right decisions for our crops, for our farms, and for our kids who are going to take over these farms over the next generations. Um, Potassium, again, is a little bit variable, um, and I believe it was research that came out about five or ten years ago uh, in Ontario. And they, um, Potassium, they see a huge benefit uh, if you put it with the seed, uh, and this is typically specific to corn. Um, so a lot of guys are leaning towards putting some of their potassium down with their corn seed. The rest of it typically gets broadcast with the nitrogen in the spring, um, and some of it actually goes down in the fall, which is... It doesn't have as much of an environmental impact as phosphorus will, so it's a little bit better of an option to do that. Those are typically the biggest ones I see. Micronutrients is a little different, um, and the biggest ones out here in Western Canada would be along the lines of copper, boron, copper for your cereals, and boron for your canola. And um, Typically, what I see for boron is the best response happens in crop. Um, because boron is leachable, if you try and put it down as a granular with seed, you'll end up getting some loss. And by the time the crop needs it for pollination, um, either it's leached or it's unavailable, it's moved somewhere else. Um, so, I mean, if you're getting into micronutrients, I think looking a little bit further into best timing and talking to an agronomist might be the best case because it's really going to depend on how you manage your crop and when you can get into your fields. Okay, Jeremy, thanks a lot for joining us today. Thank you, Sean. I appreciate it. Thanks for joining us for another episode of the Growing Series podcast. You can find more episodes of this podcast at cargillgrows.ca. I'm Sean Haney, and on behalf of Real Agriculture, I want to thank you for joining us. You've been listening to the Growing Series podcast, powered by Cargill and presented by Sean Haney and RealAgriculture.com. Cargill's experts are ready to help you make the best decisions for your farm. Find more advice at CargillGrows.ca.